Any questions? I hope not. I couldn't scribble down fast enough. There was so much good stuff in there. Pratik, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I might do is just mix things up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. You've access to the, the questions there. Yep. Um, do, do we have uh, um, Adrian on the line just now? I'm just Hi, wondering. yes, I'm here. I'm here. Hey, Adrian, I was just going to suggest, I might get Pratik just to re read through the questions uh, with you. And mm -hmm. if, if you've got any, you know, any particular feelings on these questions, then of course, you know, you can share, but there may be some that you want to discuss perhaps. Um, and if there's anybody in the audience that has asked a few of those questions, perhaps, you can actually request the microphone uh, just in case we need to clarify um, any information from you? So, uh, Pratik, are, are you happy just to yeah. move on through the questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's do this. Um, so, I think the first one from Stephen was answered. So, let's go to the next one, Adrian. So, how I how you were managing certificate related activities? Any suggestion? And I think this is the question from Mohit. And I I think this is related to the TLS certificates. Um, do you want to take the one, Adrian? Um, I, you can take it if you want. Yeah. I cannot do it. <laughs> okay. So in terms of managing certificates like uh, or TLS SSL certificate for applications, uh, what I've used in the past is things like Cert Manager. Or the, there's a company called Jetstack, and they've been producing some really good tech. Um, uh, initially, they used to have a thing called Cube Lego, uh, which is a Let's Encrypt based uh, certificate management tool. Um, their latest one is Cert Manager, which is kind of an extension to Cube Lego. Cert Manager can integrate with any like multiple types of CAs, any Acme based provider, or you can load in a private key or cert uh, uh, or a certifying a certificate authority in there as well. So if you if you want to automate, I would say have a look at Cert Manager. It natively integrates with uh, Let's Encrypt as well, and may be able to help you there. Oh, let's move on to the next one. The next one is from KCA. KCA is saying, with your self-managed cluster, how do you handle upgrading Kubernetes? I think this was more for you, AD. Um, okay. What's the person asking? So with your self-managed cluster, how- yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we managed the cluster upgrades with the same tool we are using to install them, which is Ansible, our Ansible scripts. And uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward actually, because well, one of the big principles of Kubernetes is to be compatible with previous versions. So you can actually like upgrade components and, and they will keep running. Of course, it needs to be done carefully and, and we do, but, but yeah, uh, just by, by upgrading different components. We first practice the upgrades in a, in a test cluster, then non-production clusters, and then finally the, the master components. Um, but yeah, we, we just used the, um, the Ansible tool we, with our scripts, uh, and it worked well so far. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and just extending on what Adrian said as well, like if you, if you are in that scenario as well, where in place might not be a solution for you, um, have a think about blue-greening. I've, I've used blue-greening a lot previously, blue-greening cluster. But the challenge with that is if you don't have your configuration and applications deployed on top of your cluster uh, version control or checked in as a state somewhere, it's very hard to blue green. So it depends on what might be a good solution for you. But yeah, as what Adrian said, and maybe think about blue greening or canaring, in fact, as well. Yeah, cool. yeah I agree. Next one is from Daryl, which says, during de development, do you provide containers, pods to developers to use, or is it encouraged to develop locally? Also, could you go more into detail on the issues you came across with persistent dis uh, persistent data? I think he's asking how many USB thumb drives you had to plug into your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good one. Maybe I'll take this one. So in terms of development workflows, uh, what I've seen, and I'm a developer as well, what I've done in the past as well, 
um, generally, let's say if I'm writing Golang or Java, I would have my ID, I would just write my code in there. But then the first round of testing is maybe locally on maybe let's say Minikube or Docker desktop. Now, in some cases, that might not be possible because you may have integration requirements, you may have um, a memory, CPU resource requirements. So in, in scenarios like those, what we've, we I have seen or what we've done is um, created namespaces for dev environments on low level environments. You can actually use namespaces to do anything you want, but we've created integrated environments where developer will uh, you know, try to deploy their code or run their code and see what happens. So it depends um, on your application level requirements. But yeah, my standard workflow has been developed locally using the IDE, um, connected to local assets. Like if I can run the database locally or not, and then maybe build the Docker image, test it out locally in the cluster. If I can't even do that, then maybe go to the actual cluster running somewhere. Um, any thoughts on that, Adrian? Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting one because we are mixing Linux with, with Windows, but uh, we have a really good experience with Visual Studio. So Visual Studio kind of creates um, uh, your Docker configuration that the developers can run. Then the, the configuration that goes into production, is, into the cluster is a little bit different, but, but it's, it's close enough that the developers can do their local testing and then we uh, we can deploy with chain keys into the cluster. So yeah, I definitely agree that, that it's important for developers to be able to, to run the, their containers. I guess uh, if you have some crazy microservice application, then then it will become more complicated. So, so it depends a bit, but Docker definitely gives you the ability to run locally and to run into your cluster. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one always. Um, cool. Hopefully that answers. So moving on to the next one from Ian. I don't know if we already answered this, but maybe I'll read it again. Uh, why use keep a light D or HA proxy when that functionality is available from K8s? Um, yeah, I don't think I, I answered that one, uh, but I don't think it's, it's available. So Kubernetes does give you high availability. I do agree. Like if you have your deployment, then you delete your pod or, or the pod falls for any reason, it, it will come back. Great. But what we are after is a load balancer. So even if you use EKS, you still need a, a load balancer because that's the, the entry point from your DNS um, into a, so your DNS needs to be linked into a particular IP. So that, that IP needs to be highly available. And then from there, it will go into your application, which might have like, more or less pods depends on, on how much you're scaling, but, but load balancers are the, the thing that goes in front of your request. So you, you usually publish an API or you will publish um, a web application, but in any case, it will be um, domain name towards uh, some particular IP. You can publish many A records, that's true, but then not all the, the web clients will understand that or will do the load balancing correctly. So, so it's important that your the IP that you publish is highly available as well. Yeah, brilliant. Awesome. Hopefully that answers. Um, moving on to the next one from Raul. Uh, what was the role of Ansible in the whole case study, if any? Um, we, we use it for installing the cluster and, and for upgrading it. And that's pretty much it. Um, so we use it as our Git operations tool for the, the cluster upgrade and, and management. That's that's it. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Cool. Hopefully that answers. Next one from Chad. Uh, what are your thoughts on using Rancher, Rancher, Rancher as a method to orchestrate Kubernetes? Hmm. You want to take it? I can answer, but I'm sure. Yeah. No. Oh, go for it. Okay, uh, I think Rancher is awesome. Um, we decided to manage things ourselves, but, but Rancher is, is super advanced and, and makes installing clusters very easy and, and they have like a lot of interesting features. Uh, it's just one of those many, many ways to install Kubernetes. So now it's becoming easier because, well, uh, the, the cloud providers are, uh, they, they give you an easy way to, to get Kubernetes as a service. Before it wasn't the case, and Rancher got popular, 
uh, as an easy way to to install your Kubernetes cluster and, and many of them. So so even up to today has a lot of features also when it comes to um, to manage of, of volumes and, and I don't know how many other things they have. So definitely worth taking a look. Um, but you might want to customize things yourself. So I guess it depends on on how deep you want to go. Yeah, spot on, spot on. Rancher is really good tech. I love Rancher. Cool, hopefully that answers. So next one is from the Vedita, and this might also be for you, Adrian. But the question is, can I please know that uh, what benefits it gives as in the last slide? So the oh. is yeah sorry uh yeah it's the, the promise of of DevOps making developers more proactive that's uh, making your if they're more proactive then there are less errors you can recover faster from from any production issue if there is um, people are happier also so this this was study in depth I recommend you to check the Dora uh, it's the development DevOps something organization uh, last year. I was published um, with Google, but this organization makes a very interesting scientific case study where they send this poll to, to many companies and they can tell what the high efficient organizations do differently from the other ones. And they make a scientific case that using DevOps makes you happier <laughs> and makes, makes you more proactive. Um, and makes your company overall better. So yeah, is DevOps is, is good from many perspectives and Kubernetes is the, the last big innovation uh, regarding DevOps. No, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, yeah, and it just reminds me, I think there was a question previously as well around how do you measure developer productivity or satisfaction or something like that. I just mm -hmm. wanted to add to that, like in the past, the way I've, uh, I've worked or I've, I've, I've solved that or addressed that is um, you do a delta between your current state and your state when you've done the transformation or you've done some uplift work. So for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example, like one of the organizations that I went into um, um, and it, it's, it was pretty much like before we started on the Kubernetes journey there, the time it take, took to deploy an application into or release a feature was around, I think, four weeks or five weeks. Um, and provisioning certificates was at least two months. Um, uh, creating volumes, requesting hardware was because um, they were pretty um, old school company. It was, it, it was a challenge. And overall, so we had, we measured those uh, metrics. And corresponding to that, what we also measured was developer happy happiness, if you will, um, and and the, the time it takes for them to release their code. And when we did the transformation, we moved to AWS, we had the clusters up and running and all of that. And probably it came with moving to AWS, maybe. But when we started using all of that, we measured all of those metrics again, and then we compared the delta. And it wasn't as much as productivity delta, but it was more around how your developers, your developers are happier or, you know, are you spending less time in places which do not matter and metrics like that. But yeah, I thought I'll just add that. Uh, yeah, quick, quick comment. So Kevin Colas Arundel, he just published the, the report I was talking about. So you guys can, can take a look in the chat section. KCA on the money, always. Um, in the chat. Cool. Awesome. So moving on to the next one, I think uh, Mohit is asking, are you using service mesh in your Kubernetes environment? Adrian? Uh, not in, in the, the case study I, I talk about. Uh, yes, yes, in other customers. It's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, Istio gives you a lot of features like um, the ability to have like encryption uh, within your, your cluster, which is something you, you talk about and, and it's, it's really cool. Also doing some very interesting things with uh, green blue deployments. Uh, I think it becomes more relevant if you if you have a lots of applications also because the, the way uh, services are published won't scale as much if you have things in the thousands maybe it becomes uh, more relevant so 
but then you need to be careful. It could get a bit complicated to, to install Istio as well. It's, it's another layer of complexity. I don't know what's your, your experience, Pratik? Yeah, no, uh, spot on. Like the layer of complexity wise, um, and I think that would, that applies to Kubernetes as well. Like both the technologies are very, very complex, specifically um, Istio, it has a very steep learning curve. And generally what I've done and I've, when, I've, when I've had chat with people around service meshes is do you really need a service mesh? If so, yes, can we justify those use cases or can we list out the use cases for a service mesh? And then you pick out a service mesh. Like there, there are um, other ones as well, like Linkerd um, or the others. But yeah, there's a steep learning curve. They do offer a lot of functionality, but a massive uh, learning curve to any of this. And it's very hard, very easy to <laughs> make mistakes with things like Istio. But I'll add this with caveat: like it's if you if you know how Q Istio works, and if you've ma Mastered Istio, it's worth the pain. Cool. Hopefully that gives you the perspective. Um, next one from Adrian is, I have kids on the list in the platform I'm developing. Can I defer that task to the last in my list? Is it wise to do so? I'm, I'm kind of not sure what that question means, but I'm going to take a stab at it. Oh, sorry, go for it. Yeah, I think I think Adrian is saying if he should deploy his application into Kubernetes, maybe that's what he's referring to. And I'm guessing if it is just one app, if you want to learn, then maybe yes. Um, but Kubernetes is really meant for many applications. But as a learning exercise, then yes, go for it. Uh, and it's not that hard nowadays, um, especially in the cloud. Uh, but if you, yeah, if your application is simple, maybe you, you don't need that much. Um, you can just use maybe a Docker container is a good compromise. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have a, an easy way to package your app and to publish it. Um, but yeah, um, it's more meant for, for scaling many applications and for standardizing the deployment. It's, it will be a bit too complicated for what would be solving. So the overhead would be too much. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely spot on. Um, speaking of overhead as well, the next question from Mohit is, is service mesh an overhead if one has few workloads on Kubernetes? Um, I would say if you have, like, it depends, like if you don't have, if you let's say have got a couple of applications and I don't think any of the tools like service mesh or Kubernetes in that manner, you should think about what, why you want to use Kubernetes or service mesh, because as Adrian just said, for one or two application, it might not be a feasible, viable option because there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to manage, but you have a very large ecosystem. That's when the power of Kubernetes and power of a service mesh will come into picture and it will give you that return. And this is honest truth, right? I'm not trying to sell Kubernetes or anything. No one can sell Kubernetes, but anyway, um, it, it depends. If you have a large scale or large number of applications, then obviously go for Kubernetes and service mesh. But for one or two, Maybe there are other tools you can look at. Adrian? Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with, with you. Awesome. Uh, moving on to the next one. I think you already uh, answered the next one previously. Uh, let's move on to the other one. Um, wait, hang on. I'm ready to jump. Yeah, from Ian. Kate's Kubernetes is as complicated as physical on-prem data centers, if not more so. And takes a long, long, and takes long to set up. If you are moving to cloud, why wouldn't you just use serverless? Very interesting question. Um, I'll I'll take a first stab at it, and then maybe give it to Adrian. So yeah, it depends. If you are if your application can be used in a serverless fashion, like you can write Lambda functions or cloud functions, or maybe serverless containers like Pocket, go for it. Uh, the less infrastructure you have to manage, the better for you, or and the better. You, the more time you'll focus on delivering value. Now, if you take a step back and think about what you're actually trying to deploy, if you have a large fleet of complicated interconnected applications, uh, which have maybe runtime more than 15 minutes or something with serverless can't accommodate, or you're building a, um, I don't know, a complicated application, which is not supported by serverless platform, then maybe also think about Kubernetes. 
again, it's it's. I'm not saying that Kubernetes is only meant for complicated applications. The return on investment, if if let's say as an organization you're building out a platform based on Kubernetes, and if you build your abstraction right, the wider organization will always benefit because it will have rich set of features, much more richer than what serverless can offer today, with minimal effort. But that abstraction layer has to be succinct. It has to be uh, perfect that you don't bleed implementation details into your application layer. Now, what I mean by that is if you are running a Kubernetes platform and if your team needs to understand how I configure my cluster, how many nodes I have, how much do I scale, then kind of that is not a good abstraction. For your development teams, it should be like, I have a Docker container, go run, and it should just run. So if you think like very roughly, if you think about it, if you have a platform team which can build that abstraction for your value or for your development teams, it's like, yep, I just run my container. Where it runs, I don't even know. Um, I, I use that something. Um, also, Lambda functions after you you reach 40% usage of your machine, of your EC2 instance, for example, it's going to be more expensive. So from the cost per perspective, Docker containers are more cost effective. And also from the vendor lock-in perspective, um, you, you own your platform if you're using Kubernetes, uh, when in the case of Lambda, well, not, not so much. So you can also run serverless or function as a service within Kubernetes if you want. Um, but I would say also a bit of philosoph philosophical perspective. If you want to own how you do your IT, then, well, containers, I think, are the way to go. Also, they are more popular. Um, if you compare both in Google Trends, I did before, and, well, containers and Kubernetes are popular, more popular than, than Lambda. But Lambda has much, much heavier um, advertisements. So, so there is also that. There is a, a lot of um, publicity advertisement when, when it comes to AWS services. Yeah, no, spot on, spot on. Hopefully that helps. Uh, probably, I think this might be the last one for the day from Mohit, um, is does Kubernetes provide any native solution for managing certificates like if MTLS is implemented within the cluster? Um, Unfortunately, for application purposes, there's no out-of-the-box native solution, or at least what from what I can think of that Kubernetes will provide um, for like your application communication. Um, you would, if you use something like Istio, like a service mesh, uh, the mesh CA or the Citadel aspects in in Istio does that for you. It will provide those certificates for you. If not, and if you're rolling your own kind of an MTLS uh, mesh. Um, then have a look at something like Cert Manager or something which can dynamically provision uh, certificates for your internal um, usage. Anything you want to add, Adrian? Uh, no, no, I, I agree with you. So, yeah, I think you need to add tooling if you want to manage those things. Yeah, um, absolutely. Oh, brilliant. So we have almost smashed to all the questions. Ah, so sorry, one last one at top from Jim. I'm interested in more in operational aspect for HCD. IT teams or organization as developers do not get to maintain Kubernetes, for example, master nodes, DR, backups for HCD for HA. As Kubernetes is great, but operational readiness is difficult thoughts. Yeah, interesting. I think uh, with Maybe I'll take the first time at it. So Q operational readiness for Kubernetes in, in, in organizations which deploy self-hosted Kubernetes or on-prem Kubernetes, I think it has matured a lot. Yes, it is difficult, but it has matured a lot from back in the day when there was no consistent way of standing up the tool chain to what it is today. Um, and I've managed self-hosted uh, Kubernetes, some on cloud, um, without spending much effort. It's all about how you can build tooling and abstraction around your Kubernetes layer. And if you use pipeline everything, CI, CD, everything, most of the battle is one, like the, the difficult aspect is one, but you will still get into those edge cases and gnarly situation where you can't do an in-place upgrade. Adrian, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. So definitely, we'll, I, I agree that 
it's getting easier, but you still need people to look after your cluster. Um, less than before, um, we're quite efficient. Um, in many places, we, we don't need to look after the cluster that much, but yeah, every now and then you, you do need to do something. So yeah, there is a little bit of operational overhead uh, and you will need specialized people like uh, DevOps or, or sysadmin to, to look after the, um, the healthiness of your infrastructure which goes a bit beyond what Kubernetes does. Like you have networking, you have um, persistence uh, and so on and so forth, firewalls and so on. Brilliant. Um, sounds good. So we've gone through most of the question. Maybe it's time to hand it to Stephen. Yeah, that's, I counted 85 questions there, which I think uh, must be, uh, it has to be a global record. So well done, chat. 